Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057 Introduction to Law. This is week two of 2019, term two. Well, we have a good roll up, um, great to see. And I really do love taking the Introduction to Law unit. You can probably tell that. It's um, something that is very dear to my heart. Many of you have different motivations for studying law. Some of you are doing this as part of a degree that is not um, a law degree. Some of you intend to become lawyers, but many of you don't. I fully understand that. Part of the way we teach this unit is if you are going to be a lawyer, and if you say, well, that's not relevant to me, bear in mind that what I like to do is ensure that you at least think like lawyers and you understand how lawyers think. So during the week, have we all been doing our homework, the homework that I set for you? Yes. As a result of that, do you, William's saying no, and that's good. I like honesty. <laughs> As a result of that, have you um, started to think a little differently, talk a little differently, and very importantly, have you started to listen a little differently? Please use the chat facility or unmute your microphone to provide some feedback. Trying to do it? Yes. Yes, we're getting a few responses. More aware, I like that response. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, says Lucy. So, finding myself saying depends. <laughs> I like that. The, uh, everyone wants to find a lawyer with only one hand, don't they? The old joke, lawyers providing some advice and then immediately saying yes, but on the other hand, I don't want a two-handed lawyer. I want a lawyer that says this is what it is. Um, I have tried, says Glenn. And William says, yes, so William has done his homework during the week. That's good, thank you. Um, it's important that you start to think like a lawyer. Some of you have started to do some research in relation to simple things, generic things like the active versus the passive voice. And I hope you understand why it is that I encourage you to speak in the active voice. It's more direct, it provides more information more quickly. And from the recipient's perspective, generally speaking, it makes it an easier task to understand what it is that you wish to say. Listening, yes. Talking, not sure, so sure, says Grace. So keep up the good work. Please continue. Now, the next thing is, have you started to find your favourite websites? And if so, have you started to bookmark in an orderly manner that makes sense to you? And we're getting some responses now. Yes, good. And if you um, haven't muted your microphone, I'm going to invite you to do that. So feel free to unmute your microphone if you um, wish. Oh, we're getting a lot of yeses. People are finding websites, absolutely. Federal Register, really like the bookmark system. Getting there, bookmarking is a way to go. Why am I, we haven't talked one bit of law yet. Have you noticed that? It's introduction to law. And oddly, I haven't mentioned one thing about law not one scrap, but what we're doing is we're talking about the groundwork. We're trying to get ourselves thinking and organised like a lawyer. Gary says, Jade and Westlaw are some favourite sites. Some good choices there. Really like both of those. Um, I really like LexisNexis also. You need to be organised. Law is a very stressful occupation and it's stressful to study. And if you're not on top of things, then it will make it very difficult for you to succeed. So please consider how you organise your life around your studies. And the more organised that you are generally in the study of law, the less stressful it will be. Law is extremely stressful in terms of study and practice. So you need to be ahead of the game. Have any of you gone way to the end of um, the material where I think I provide a level three um, preparation to level three standard for short term um, take home papers and invigilated examinations? Has anyone found that video yet? I'm going to ask you to do some homework and look at that now, uh, not now, but during this week. Oh, it's a few have seen it. And yes, so thank you for watching that finding that. If you haven't seen it, have a look at it now. I know it's right at the end. It might be under assessments, 
It's on Moodle, you'll be able to find it. And the, what I'm looking for is for you to learn at level three standard. If you don't know what I mean by that now, you will by the end of the video. And it means thinking ahead and being well prepared, essentially. But what you think is well prepared may not be necessarily what I'm saying well prepared is. Have a look at the video and you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So your task is to become well prepared, think about where you'll access the law and start to do some research. I'm gonna challenge you with a question now, and that is this, and I'm serious. If I gave you a legal problem, a typical legal problem, where someone provides you with a series of facts and asks you to provide an, an advice as to the likely outcome, do you think that you could provide a sensible advice in written form that looks as though you are a lawyer, accesses legal material, and is footnoted in an appropriate manner, cited in an appropriate manner? So yes or no, do you think that you could make a fair fist of that this week if I asked you to do it? Don't worry, I'm not going to. Now, people are saying, no, yes, not right now, yes, probably not, yes, no, I probably say no, not very well, only basic, I could give it a good shot, yes, and no, not, I think so. Excellent, so we're getting a range. Now, here's your homework for this week, and I'm dead serious about this. I'm not going to give you a legal problem, but what I want you to do is listen to the news, read newspapers, read an article, or listen to someone providing an issue that is legal based. In other words, it doesn't matter where you source it, but I want you to identify one legal problem and ask yourself, if I was the lawyer representing that party in the dispute, whether it's civil, criminal, family law, whatever, could I give some advice to them which means identifying the main facts, identifying the legal issues, doing some research, and then providing a written advice that looks like a lawyer and is cited, referenced like a lawyer would do. I'm not asking you to do it, but I'm asking you to go through that process. And if at the end of the week you say, I don't think I could, then I want you to have another go. In other words, I will not accept no for an answer. By the end of next week, I want you to all say, if I ask you this question again, yes, I could do it. Don't worry, it doesn't have to be to QC standard, but it has to be such that you could present it in a fashion that works well. Am I asking too much of you? You can answer this as a serious question. Is that too much of an ask? No, no, no. Oh, I'm getting the right response. You are a good cohort. You're all going to do very well. I don't think so. That's an acceptable answer as well. Okay, I'm not assessing you on this. It's for self-reflection, but I'm serious. I really want you to feel as though you have the ability now to identify the material facts identify the legal issues associated with that legal problem, find the appropriate rules that relate to that problem, the appropriate law, and then apply it and apply it in a written form. If you want, you can actually go through and complete the task. And if you want, you can upload your response onto Moodle um, under Q&A, and just say, look, here's what I came up with. And we can all look at that and provide some feedback, nice feedback, gentle feedback, encouraging feedback, positive feedback. So if you want to go that further step and actually do it, then please feel free to do it and upload it. And we'll all have a look at it. Okay, I extend that task to you as a mandatory task. And the further matter of uploading is I invite you to do it if you wish. All right. Are we all happy to undertake that task? We accept the challenge? Good. You'll notice that what I did was I said, 
there is a kind of structure to the way in which you look at a legal problem. What are the acronyms? Number one, you identify the material facts. Number two, you identify the issues, so MI. Number three, you identify the rules, R. Number four, you apply those rules, A. And number five, you come to a conclusion, happens to be in writing, C. That spells M-I-R-A-C, MIRAC. Jamie says, what about IRAC, I-R-A-C, same deal. Um, there are different acronyms that essentially mean the same thing. I like MIRAC because I think it's important you identify the material facts first. But a lot of people say that the process of legal reasoning is really IRAC, I-R-A-C, which is issues, rules, application, conclusion. It's kind of the way we think as lawyers. So I'm going to ask you to do that this week as your advancement as thinking like lawyers. And remember, I took the I took I took the honour of inviting you to the club last week and I met it. You're now part of the legal club. So let's exercise those legal brains. Many of you may go on to involve yourself in litigation. Others may be interested in social justice. Um, Justice Stephen Gagler of the High Court in 2015 wrote a quote, and I'll read it to you. You may go on to become great advocates for the poor and the oppressed in social justice litigation. If that is your ambition, then I don't wish to dissuade you, but you should recognise that you will be contributing hugely to social justice simply by being a competent and ethical lawyer solving your client's problems. My advice to you, the most inspirational and constructive thing I can say is go forth and build bridges. So that's Stephen Gagler, Justice Gagler. All right, um, so we know what the A and the C mean, application and conclusion, we've got that. The R means rules. What are the rules? Can anyone tell me where the main sources of the rules can be found? What do I mean by the legal rules? Legislation, statute, common law and legislation. Excellent. Acts, regulations, any others? Good. So the rules, procedural rules, says Rachel. Yes, that's good. Regulations, procedural rules. Um, when we talk about legal rules, it's a very broad term, but can be divided into two main sections. Legislation, also known as statute, also known as acts of parliament. And the second is case law, also known as common law. Within the first, acts or legislation, we have principal legislation, which are acts of parliament, and we have subordinate or secondary legislation or delegated legislation, which is still legislation, but at a slightly at a lower level. Um, and examples of the first primary legislation, really acts of parliament. So if you see the Property Law Act, that's legislation, which is primary legislation. If you see a regulation, property law regulations, that's delegated legislation. It kind of fits with the Act, but it's not the Act, if you know what I mean. But all of that we class as this broad category of legislation. That's the first part of our primary sources of law. And the second part of our primary sources of law is the common law, also known as the judge-made law. So if you're answering a legal problem and you're reading a textbook, what you're looking at is really a very important secondary source of law. It's not a primary source of law. The primary sources of law are legislation and case law. Secondary sources of law are things like textbooks. And what you'll find is that there's a very confusing um, instance of the repetition of the same word in law that means slightly different things. And already you would have picked up on that. 
because I've used the word primary in a couple of different concept, concepts or, or different ways this evening. So I said that we've got primary, um, primary sources of law, uh, legislation on the one hand, and case law on the other, and then I've used the, the word primary again in the context of primary legislation and secondary or delegated legislation within that first subsection. Oh, I hope that makes some sense. So secondary sources of law are things like this. So let's think about the distinction between an Act of Parliament, the Acts Interpretation Act, and the textbook, The New Lawyer. If you wish to advance an argument that a certain legal conclusion should follow as a result of applying the rules to the legal issues, and you refer to the Acts Interpretation Act, section 14a, then what you are doing is you're citing to the judge a source of primary law, which is part of the legislation. If you refer to the new lawyer as your authority for the proposition, you're really purporting to refer to secondary source of the law, which is a textbook, and guess which one the judge will listen to as having far more authority Primary, primary, absolutely. So what we can glean from that is when you're going through this exercise in your mind this week about trying to determine a legal conclusion to a legal problem, whilst you may go and look at textbooks, remember that primarily, there I've used it again, for the most part, we are looking for answers that come from the primary sources of law. Acts of Parliament, broadly on one hand, and case law on the second. Now, you probably get why Acts of Parliament are important, because they're the statutes that are made by Parliament. They're the laws of the land, aren't they? Why on earth should we listen to what the judges have to say? And is there a difference between what the Parliament has to say about legal issues in legislation compared to what the judges have to say as part of our case law or common law. Is there a difference? So Paul says, judges interpret the law. Yes, Kieran says the courts interpret the law, context to the issue. Suzanne says it comes down to interpretation. Emily says, remember the separation of powers. All good points. If it came to a straightforward conflict where the statute says one thing and a judge in a case had made a decision that came to an entirely opposite conclusion. Which one do you think takes priority? Katie says statute, Kate, statute, 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 legislation. Yes, absolutely. So legislation, do, do any of you play 500? You know what I mean by, William does, yes. Some of the younger ones don't even know what I'm talking about when I say 500, do they? No, you don't. When I was an article clerk in the early 80s, one of my great joys was playing 500 with the office manager of the large law firm where I worked and two of the solicitors. And uh, the 500 games were intense. I'm not gonna tell you what 500 is. You'll have to Google it and work it out. But I'll give you a hint, it's a great game um, and uh, you should try it. Now, have any of you heard of the term, and I'm not meaning Donald Trump here, but have you heard of the word Trump? That trumps something? You've heard of that? Yes? Trumped, trumped, all right. So think of legislation as a trump card over common law. It will overrule it, okay? so. But it's still important. The common law, the judge-made law is still important, even though it plays second fiddle, as it were, to legislation. So if you're trying to work through this legal problem, as you will do this week, once you've identified the material facts, 
and you've identified what you think are the legal issues, William says, yes, yeah, see, William knows it's a trump card, which is the highest in the deck. That's right. Um, once you've identified what you think the legal issues are, where do you think that you will find the, the R, the rules? Where will you go to find the rules in relation to it? Let's say it's a problem to do with bankruptcy that you choose as your research topic. Rachel says legislation, acts, state legislation, register of legislation. Yes, yes. So legislation, I, I always think legislation is a great place to start. And to be honest, that's what I do. I go to the legislation first. There's no right or wrong answer with this. You can be creative. And this is where you start to develop your own system, which ties in with the second assessment, which is the toolkit, isn't it? So the second assessment, remind me, is the toolkit. You need to create your own toolkit. There's no pro formas. I'm not giving you a template. You don't have a template like you do the first one. Second one, it's up to you. Whatever works for you. And everyone has a different style. Some people use Word documents. Other people use some, um, um, you know, different forms. Uh, might be Excel document, whatever. Anyway, once you start to work out what works for you in terms of legal research, then you may be starting to document and putting into the second assessment. But we've identified that you're probably wanting to find legislation. If you're dealing with a bankruptcy problem this week, what's the name of the act that you probably want to have a look at first as part of your general legal research? The Bankruptcy Act, exactly. And is the Bankruptcy Act Commonwealth or state? Rachel and Emily came in very quickly, Paul very quickly, Christine very quick. Oh, you're all onto this, it's Commonwealth. Now, those of you who didn't know about the Bankruptcy Act and didn't know that it was Commonwealth might say, how did they know that? Well, they just did. So when you are practicing in law, even though I say there's no way that you'll know everything, you will get to know some of the basics. So you will get to know that the Property Law Act is a state-based act, but the Family Law Act is a Commonwealth Act. I'm gonna ask you this question. If you have a clear conflict between what is said I can't imagine this happens too often, but if it did, if you had a clear conflict about what is stated in Commonwealth legislation compared to what is stated in state legislation, which one will trump the other? Oh, you're a quick group. Holy, am I allowed to say holy mackerel? I think I am. Very good, excellent work, Commonwealth. So you're starting to see that there are different priorities assigned to different parts of the primary law. So even though we're saying that um, uh, legislation is a primary source of law, we're also identifying that not all legislation is of the same value. Some potentially will override others. And we've identified that legislation is primary um, source of the law and the common law, the judge-made law, is also a primary source of the law, but we've identified that legislation overrules the case law. So the Commonwealth law will be regarded as more influential, binding if you like, than the state-based law. I'm gonna ask you another qu difficult question, but we'll see how you go. You're a very bright group, so I'm optimistic. How on earth will you find out whether a particular piece of legislation or an area of practice rather, is Commonwealth based as opposed to state based? Where's the starting point? Oh wow, Glenn is really quick and very specific. 
Gary got it right, Timothy got it right, Emily got it right. Naomi got it right, question mark. I like the question mark. We can be more confident than that. Yes, it's the, it's the constitution. And both Glenn and Emily identified that specifically within the constitution for the Commonwealth of Australia, we need to consider section 51. So, so that I can have a sip of tea, would anyone, and I'm looking at Glenn and Emily here, like to unmute their microphone and tell us what is contained within section 51? And those of you that don't know are probably looking up your Federal Register of Legislation or Ostley as we speak. So what's in section 51? Who wants to tell us? You can unmute your microphone. This is a, an oral response. I'm muting the microphones. Yes, yes, Glenn. Uh, section 51 is uh, separated into 30, what, 34 subsections, um, and they are trade, commerce with other countries and among states, taxation, um, but does not dis to discriminate between states and parts of states, bounties on the production and export of goods, uh, borrowing money on public credit for the, of the Commonwealth, telegraph, telephony and other like services, uh, the Navy and military defence of the Commonwealth and of several states and control of forces to execute and maintain law of the Commonwealth, lighthouses, lightships, beacons and buoys, uh, what, astronomical and We probably don't, probably don't need to read them all, but thank you, Glenn. I appreciate that. Is, and is the pronunciation Glenn or Glenn? Glenn. Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm sorry to cut you off there. But by now, I hope that others have caught up with Glenn in ter and Emily in terms of finding Section 51 of the Commonwealth Constitution and identifying those um, powers. So thank you. Now, Glenn, what do those powers mean? There, you, you were reading from a list, which is great, but what do those powers mean? I, I think that they mean they are basically where the Commonwealth itself can lay rulings down. And if the states try and overlap those rules, they will get uh, what, trumped um, by the Commonwealth legislations and things like that. Excellent. Um, that's right. So Section 51 sets out a number of powers that are powers that are, and Chris got this, concurrent powers where both the federal and the state parliament have the ability to make laws. So, for example, in taxation, as I recall, states used to have their own taxation laws where they re, re, um, render state taxes. Um, there's another section in the Constitution which provides for exclusive powers to the Commonwealth, where only the Commonwealth has power and it's not shared with the states. But that list that um, Glenn was um, going through, where I cut him off, uh, you're absolutely right, that's concurrent powers so that the Commonwealth does have power to make laws in relation to that and also have a look for those powers which are purely vested within the Commonwealth. And Glenn's right, if there is legislation made in relation to the same area of practice by the Commonwealth and the state, then of course the Commonwealth powers will um, take precedence over the state powers. Now Grace said that she found um, there are, what was that? There's an alteration to 26. Okay, I haven't seen that one. So these are, if you like, concurrent powers. And one of the first things to consider is whether legislation has been properly made under the constitution. So that's always a starting point. You'll see that there are a lot of items in that list of powers that are available to the Commonwealth, which there's a lot missing from it. So for example, 
an important piece of Commonwealth legislation is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. The Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. I take environmental law, so it's, it's interesting to me. But it's, there's no power under the Commonwealth Constitution for it to make laws in relation to the environment. I think in 1901, nobody thought about the environment as an area of practice. It's only been recent. So how is it then that the Commonwealth was able to make the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act when it's not listed as one of the powers available to the Commonwealth to enact? So Gary's, uh, Gary's thinking literally, does that not come under the customs side of things? Rachel says it affects all citizens. It might affect all citizens, but it's still got to be something which is conferred upon the Commonwealth in order for it to be made constitutionally. A little bit of legal history here. In the 80s, the Commonwealth and the states were at each other. They were at each other's throats. And the High Court was very busy dealing with constitutional challenges to Commonwealth legislation. The Commonwealth would purport to pass legislation arguing that it had power, not necessarily directly, but because it can be linked to things like its power to make um, laws in relation to trade and commerce or customs or something else or international treaties. So it would say, because we have power to make laws in relation to international treaties, therefore, and because this area of practice is the subject of an international treaty, we can now make laws in relation to that area of practice. Um, I'm being a bit obscure, but you get the idea where the Commonwealth was kind of trying to stretch its powers and the states were pushing back. Fairly consistently in the 80s, the states lost. They copped a beating in the High Court. So eventually, through um, the COAG um, and, uh, and, and the cooperation of the states and the, um, and the Commonwealth, there was an accord, if you like, and many things were then allowed to be passed through Commonwealth legislation with the agreement of the states, uh, with the agreement of the states. And so now that's settled down to a large degree. But you still need to consider the constitutional power of the Commonwealth to make these laws in the first place. All right. Have I confused absolutely everyone? Or is there, are there one or two of you that are, think it's, it's not too bad? We're okay? Good. All right. So when you're undertaking the task this week of trying to determine a response to this legal question, just in your own mind, you're mapping it out, you'll be thinking about whether this is Commonwealth or state legislation and then trying to find it. Now, can I ask this, has anyone had a look at my legal research videos? And I think there are four of them. Has anyone been through that process? Lots of information, yes. So some, all right. On the video, I think I use this example. Sometimes it's fairly obvious what legislation you should consider when dealing with a particular legal problem. If you have a bankruptcy problem, then probably you'd go to the Bankruptcy Act. That makes sense, doesn't it? But what if you have a problem that relates to the execution of a will or a problem that involves giving advice to someone who wants to challenge what was left in a will of a person recently deceased? Let's assume that there's some legislation that deals with that issue, and let's assume we're talking about Queensland, and you've already identified that it wills is not something where the Commonwealth has power to make laws, so it's got to be state-based legislation. Where would you, what legislation would you consider relevant when dealing with an issue to do with challenging a will? Rachel's got the answer, Emily's got the answer, with a question mark, but you're right, Emily. Not quite, Jamie. We're getting some right responses now from William and Amy. Glenn's got it right. Matthew, not quite, not quite on the right track. So the answer to that problem was the Succession Act. Now, how on earth are you supposed to know in relation to a will 
that you go to the Succession Act. I mean, if, the, if there was the Wills Act, that would make much more sense. But sometimes the Parliament has come up with a name that doesn't necessarily immediately come to mind when you're dealing with a legal problem. Now, given that I've been practicing in law for so long, I knew that it would be the Succession Act. That's where you go if you've got a problem to do with wills. But we're just coming into it. So, you know, give me a break. How am I supposed to know to look at the Succession Act? It would take me forever to go through every act to find that. So, <laughs> so Amy's come up with a, a novel response. I just Googled wills Queensland legislation and got there. Emily says, I'd go to Jade. Um, Jamie says, but how would I do that without Googling? And Paul says, search keywords. I did refer you in the legal research videos to a website that might assist you with that specific problem. Has anyone come across that website? I mention this because it'll be great for your toolkit. And this is what you've got to do. As part of your legal logic, and your toolkit, you've got to work out a way that works for you how to track down the appropriate piece of legislation relevant to the legal problem. If you can't find the legislation, you can't satisfy the R requirement in, in IRAC by finding the rule, can you? So we've got to find the legislation. Ostley says Rachel, question mark, but correct. Yes, that's good. Grace went to Ostley as well. I think Osley's great. Now, um, Glenn says it's not a term that's come over from the British Laws Succession Act. That's probably right. Gary went to Queensland Legislation website and Naomi says, I would use Osley. Okay, so you can maybe use a search function. You can maybe use a textbook. You can maybe Google. Google Scholar is a good option too. Remember Google Scholar. But there is a website. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to encourage you to look at the legal research videos. And then as you're doing that, I need you to be working proactively to think, all right, we've got all of these options, all of these different websites, what actually works for me? And it can change. And as you're doing this, you are building your answer to the second assessment, a toolkit that works for you. All right? Are there, video, are there videos on Moodle? Yes. Now, people have found these legal vid research videos, haven't they? They're under, where are they? They're probably under additional resources is my guess. No. Assessments, they're there anyway, I'm sure. I hope. If they're not, please let me know. So they're videos that I did 12 or 18 months ago. So we need to be able to find the law in statutes. And from that, we can then um, have a reasonable answer to our legal problem. What, we're, what I'm asking you to do in many ways is we're starting to think like a lawyer, aren't we? We're starting to think like a lawyer. It's a really good quote page 286 of your textbook. You might say, but I haven't got to page 286 of the textbook. I'll tell you why it's important that you probably start to look at these things. You see, if you look at page 286 of your textbook, you'll see that um, there's some commentary on legal reasoning. See that? And some commentary on the Iraq method or the Mirac method, whatever it is. So that's really important now. And it's not part of your prescribed reading. But to undertake your task this week, you really need to read from 286 onwards. So please do that because it's all part of the thinking skills. Um, I was mentioning a quote. It's actually not on that page. So I'll just mention it. Um, it's around that area. But I think this is what the textbook authors say, thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking and behaving rationally when others around you may be panicking or overreacting. 
that if you if you're the sort of person that likes to have a quote on a whiteboard to give you some clarity about your thinking that's a good one because i can guarantee that during your studies there will be times where you feel like panicking there will be times that you feel that you might be overreacting or you might identify in your colleagues that they are panicking or overreacting remember thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking and behaving rationally during those circumstances. Frontal lobe people, that's what we need you to keep in mind to practice law effectively. Don't panic, don't overreact, keep it cool, keep it calm. What you're doing is you're preparing yourself for these circumstances. You are looking at the end, what you seek to achieve, you're working back and you're filling in some gaps. You're learning how to work rationally, keep the emotion out of it, and you're trying to anticipate problems before they arise. Now, let me give you an example. My wife doesn't like me saying this. I'm supposed to say something else, but I'll say it anyway. I get in trouble for this. Um, let's assume that you get a phone call at work and your wife is also working but you know and very busy and more productive than you'll ever be or husband or partner whatever you want to say gives you a call and says <laughs> Paul says don't worry we won't tell thank you um, and it gives you a call at work you're really busy it's in the morning and says I really need you to do something for me tonight can you bring home takeaway I said I'd cook but I can't because I've got to do this and this and this and you say, yes, I will do that, whatever it might be. Now that's at 9.30 a.m. As soon as you put down the phone, something happens. Someone comes to your door, you receive a phone call, you get an urgent text or a message or something distracts, or it might be a series of things that distract. Anyway, you get home at 7 p.m. because you're very hardworking and William says, you're dead. What have you forgotten? You've forgotten the takeaway. All right, how do you feel at that moment? What are some of the emotions that you will feel at that moment when you walk in and you see your wife or hungry, <laughs> hungry, hungry and scared? You see the look on your partner's face. Where can I hide? Panic, Uber Eats, shame, shame, shame. All of those things. And let's say you've worked really hard that day and let's say you've had a really productive day and you felt really good. How are you gonna feel that millisecond later when something really bad happens? You can see the red in your eyes. Quick run for the hills, says Grace. Jamie says you're gonna be upset at yourself and you're gonna be disappointed in yourself, aren't you? Because you've let it down. You didn't want to do that. And all the positives that you've accumulated through the day have dissipated and now you're probably into negative territory. And we don't want that to happen. So here's the good thing. This was only hypothetical. What we can do is we can wind this back and we can think about it. So what we want to do is we look at the at what we wish to achieve at the end. And this is just a very small example of what I want you to do during this unit and I want you to do during your entire studies for the whole of your law studies. You want to look at the end and you want to work back in reverse order. So you want to think about the, the result that you wish to achieve and then achieve it. Honey, there was a T-Rex. <laughs> That's not going to work, Paul. Um, so what do you do the moment that you get that phone call at 9.15, knowing that there is a chance that you could be distracted by someone at your door, a phone call or a, um, a call. So what are some other things that you might do? Okay, we're getting some ideas. Make a note, says write it down. Um, you could have arranged alternate options, set up your future success, stick your note on top of the photos or glasses case, reminder in a phone, reminder, plan backwards, prioritize, put it in your phone, set an alarm, keys in the fridge. That's the answer I was after. Thanks, Jamie. Put your keys somewhere they should be, says Rachel. 
hide the keys some, somewhere important. So assuming you're driving, that's what I do. If you're driving, I work on the basis that um, the keys, you need the keys. And if the keys aren't where you expect, because you're a very ordered person, and the keys are always where they should be, then if the keys aren't there, you are going to trigger, aren't you? Something's wrong here. Why is that the case? Now I remember. All of the other ideas are great, but sometimes you don't have much time even to set a reminder. If you do, great, and that's really good. But sometimes, uh, um, once you get that call, assume this little tiny rule, a uh, set of keys, and it's on my desk or my top drawer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, while I'm on the phone, yes, I'll do that, the keys are being moved. And I might even just toss them on the floor behind me. And then when I'm half an hour later after I've done all these busy things, I think, why are my keys on the floor? Oh, yes. And then I'll move them to the fridge. If I can move them to the fridge straight away, I'll do that. But do you know what I mean? And um, what it is, is a very practical way of ensuring that you achieve the result, result that you want. Jamie says she listened to my past videos. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jamie, for that disclosure. So a practical solution implemented immediately to ensure that you don't disappoint yourself. Because if you disappoint yourself enough, to the degree that I've mentioned you will feel at 7 p.m. that night, it's going to affect your mental health. And your mental health is very important in law. I'm really gonna stress this. If you don't plan well, if you're not organized, you will suffer and you'll suffer pretty badly. So you've got to be ordered in what you do. You need to think ahead, you need to plan, you need to build the base is what we're talking about. Any questions about what I've said so far? All good? I'll give you an example, and this is just what happened to me. I'm sorry to be making this about me, I don't mean to, but um, so, Oh, Rachel said, repeat it. Yeah, so just keys in the fridge, basically, Rachel. This happened to me in my first week as an article clerk. Um, at that stage, everything was still with paper and real checks, and um, one of the partners came to me and said, could you please attend a settlement, which meant physically being at a location to exchange money for title deeds to complete a property transaction, a settlement, as we call it. So I did that. Um, and I didn't have much time. Basically, the, the partner came to me with a file and a check and some instructions and um, said, in 12 minutes from now, you must be at the other side of the city in George Street somewhere. At this, um, loca this specific location, your task is simple. I'm giving you a check. You exchange that for a title lead and you immediately return to the office. So you can imagine my enthusiasm. I grabbed the file, check was inside, and I raced out and I ran down Queen Street, turned right at George Street, got to the location, two minutes to spare, summer, so I'm perspiring, but I was pretty quick in those days, and I got there. What do you think happened? I didn't have the check. And why didn't I have the check? Because it fell out of the file. It fell out of the file because it, I was running. So that never happened to me again, ever, because from that moment on, I thought, well, I've got to do something to ensure this never happens again. So the very practical solution that I came up with that just worked for me was, all right, whenever I have a file where there's a check or a document or something that I can't afford to lose, I am literally going to staple a manila folder to the inside cover of that file and anything that's important will either be placed in that folder or bulldog clipped to that folder um, inside that mini file um, that I've created. You know, something like that. But the point is, whatever the solution is, you need to think it through and come up with a way that works for you to ensure that that won't happen again. Whether it's keys in the fridge or you staple of a file to the inside, it doesn't matter, it's got to work for you. And you can put that in your toolkit. You can say, this is what I've thought might be an issue, and working backwards, I've come up with a solution that works for me. All right? So that's, 
that's what we need to do. And it's all part of your preparation. And what you're doing this week is direct preparation for the third assessment, the briefing paper. Because if you look at past briefing papers, I've given you a problem. We haven't, we haven't discussed the specific legal issue. It's all new. I expect it to be new. But what I'm asking you to do is apply what's in your toolkit, which is the second assessment, to provide a response, a, legal, a legally researched response to a problem that I put to you in the take home paper. So in the take home paper, this is great, isn't it? You'll be expected to answer a legal problem in relation to an area of law that we haven't even talked about. And I, and I expect you to provide an answer to it. How cruel is that? It all comes down to your ability to think like a lawyer, write like a lawyer, research like a lawyer, and apply IRAC or MIRAC, if you like, in a practical, proper sense. Do you get the idea that what I'm encouraging you to do is a lot of self-management skills? Resilience is really important as well. Have a look at page 346 of The New Lawyer. I hope this page number is correct. No, I think it's, no, I think my numbers are out, sorry. Um, Self-management skills is actually 366. So have a look at chapter 10, 366. And I want you to look at that this week. And I'll know you say, but that's not part of the prescribed reading. You're asking us to do a lot of reading, a lot of preparation. And there is, a, yes, but it's all interesting and it's all necessary. And in many ways, we've got so much we've got to cover, you've got to take in a lot at the start. Don't read it like it's the most important document in the world where every word must be considered um, very carefully. I'm not, I'm not su suggesting it's unimportant, but what I'm saying is develop the ability to speed read material. Now, I'm getting a note, page 366 is the index. Is that the new lawyer, second edition, is that the one? Are we looking at different textbooks? Okay, all right, I've, I've got a few different ones, but have a look at the self-management skills and the page numbers I'm giving you that I was referring to is probably um, uh, the uh, earlier edition of the textbook, but they're all pretty similar. So anyway, read self-management skills because We've been talking about that a lot tonight, how to deal with issues, mental health and well-being, independent learning, which is part of the toolkit, reflective practice and strategies that you need to implement. So I do want you to read about that and be look after yourself. So if that works for you, yes. Exercise is important. Eat well. It's all important. Okay. Any questions so far? It's kind of like that. Hi. Yes, Jamie. Actually, in relation to the book, I have the blue one. Is so is everything in yours that should be in here? Yeah. <laughs> There's a few different versions. So Jane, yeah. you'll see Emily's got the same version that I've just shown you. I've got them all, so I'll try yeah. and refer to them. They're all pretty similar, um, and it's not difficult reading. Some of the versions have more chapters than the others, but um, I think it's available in the university library um, in digital form. So, yeah, just work with what you've got, and I'll try to identify chapters rather than necessarily too many pages, because if you've got the first edition or the second or... It doesn't really matter too much. Is that okay? All right, William's got the first as well. Um, Rebecca asks a good question. Do we need to reference in the toolkit assessment? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and we had a question, I think, which I haven't yet answered in um, Q&A about referencing in the first assessment. In the first assessment, which is your portfolio, I'm really not going to be too worried about the way in which you reference your material. I'd like you to have a go at it, but don't worry. If you find it a bit overwhelming, then I'm not gonna mark you down too much. But give it a go. 
And by referencing, I mean applying the Australian Guide to Legal Citations, currently in its fourth edition. Can I summarise it this way? If you really don't have time to take in the a, um, AGLC at this stage, what you can do is learn through osmosis. Have a look at the way in which material is referenced in your textbook and follow suit. So you'll see that um, the referencing is done by footnotes. So that's the first thing about legal referencing, unlike say Harvard referencing, which is referencing in the body of the text. For legal referencing, and you'll see this in cases, um, it's footnote referencing, okay? So follow what's in the textbook. And there are a few other little tricks. For example, if you're referring to a case or a piece of legislation, the name of the parties in the case will be italicized and the name of the legislation will be italicized. So if you don't, it, it just makes you look like you're not a lawyer. Um, in the second assessment, I would hope that you undertake the referencing task a little more seriously and a little more diligently. So in other words, we're getting better at it. So I hope that answers the question. I'm going to ask a favour, and some of you are sending emails to me um, for questions, which is fine, but I would prefer that you ask the question in Q&A. A few reasons for that. That is, um, it makes me feel a bit more comfortable that I'm not giving specialist advice to some people and not others. Um, second is that if you ask in Q&A, you get the benefit of not just my response, but your colleagues responses as well. And very often your colleagues can answer a question just as well, if not better than I can, and very often can do so more quickly. So if you have a question about anything to do with the course, the unit rather, you can send me an email, but the first thought should be, I'll put it in Q&A. Um, you don't have to address it to me. In fact, if you don't address it to me, others will feel that they have an opportunity to answer the question or provide their feedback. And if you do decide to provide a response or answer a question from one of your colleagues, if I think it's wrong, then I will very gently and very nicely suggest that I think it's wrong. Likewise, if I provide a response and you think I'm wrong, please feel free to add your commentary. Just be nice to me, that's all, as I promise I will be with you. Um, there's not necessarily going to be a right answer to a lot of questions. And as I think I mentioned last week, one of the advantages of law is that you can be creative. There's a whole lot different range, range of ways of researching and going about answering a problem. Um, you don't always have to come up with the same answer that I do. Provided you go through the legal logic process, then you could still do very well to a question. Um, and Paul says, yes, that way, if we ask the questions through Q&A, we all learn. Emily says, can we discuss the weekly problems and are we submitting them correctly? I won't have time during our sessions to necessarily answer or consider all the weekly problems, but I will have a look. And um, uh, for those of you who haven't yet submitted your response to the weekly problems, please do so. I'm just looking now at um, the Moodle site and I can see oh, some great responses there. One thing I do note is that there's an ab a distinct absence with only one exception to replies. So if you provide a response, then um, that's great, but feel free to reply to others as well. So, you know, great work, Bill, like your response. Um, have you thought about this aspect, you know, regards Mary, that type of thing. So, yes, I do want you to respond. You, can, you don't have to, to have the one thread. You, we can have multiple threads as it is now, but feel free to dive into somebody else's thread and add to it. So we may find that some have much more than one response. And um, if you haven't already provided a response, do that now. Okay, now 
Jamie says, can you mention the questions we have to do each week in case someone doesn't know? I only found out about it on the 21st. Uh, lots to learn on Moodle. So what's, what questions are they, Jamie? Are you talking about the ones on Moodle or just the, the homework that I give you on the run? Yeah, it's no, just the ones that were on Moodle. Um, the ones that you sent an email out on last Friday and then everybody, oh, I got to do those questions. <laughs> so. That sounds like me. I probably had a look last Friday and I was horrified that nothing was happening. So I said, let's get going. So thank you. But no, take that as a standing request of mine that each week you provide some form of response to the weekly problems. So I hope that answers your question, Jamie. Thank you. And I hope by now everyone has registered, if that's the right term, their CQ Law account for the first assessment for the professional portfolio. It's ridiculously easy assessment. Don't think too much about it. If you provide, if you do something that's online and you provide a reasonable response to each of the criteria, odds are you'll do well. I think typically for this assessment, the average mark is something like 15 out of 20 or so, 16 out of 20. So distinction is kind of the average mark. Um, so people have already got their CQ Law accounts up and running. That's great. If you haven't, then please ask um, about it. So a few haven't yet set up their CQ Law account. Just to confirm, um, what I have done is uh, there is the CQ Law account um, set up in draft. Follow the instructions on Moodle. If you're really struggling, if you just can't work it out, ask a question through Q&A and say, can't do this, need help. And I would hope that one of your colleagues will jump in and say, I got there, here's how I did it and to help each other. I'm there as well, but um, you might be able to assist each other more readily than I can. All right, well, thank you for your patience this evening. Do we have any further questions before we wrap up? Regarding the Moodle problem, must it be answered formally, academically, or informally with a personal response? I'm happy for an informal response, but you can answer it academically if you wish. All right, all good. Thank you very much for your attendance. We'll see you next week. I'll end the recording now. Bye then.